from the web webcast to here. Okay. Uh, the microphones have to be turned off, so if you're going to be talking with the audience at the end, uh, be sure that someone's going to give a mic okay. to the audience. Okay. Okay. I'll uh, run out with questions. Try, try and hold the microphone here so I can keep uh, feedback from. Hey, are we ready? All right. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Awesome. Um, well, as Alia so nicely pointed out, we're the only people standing in the way of happy hour. So uh, we promise to make this a fun, engaging uh, conversation. All right. Um, so without further ado, we're going to introduce the panelists, starting with Matt. Yeah, hi. I'm uh, Matt Moss. Um, I oversee uh, development and strategic partnerships for Firelight Camps. Um, we are a small but growing uh, glamping uh, company. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Shakita Frazier, co-owner of Camp Yoshi, where I oversee business development and brand partnerships. I'm Channing Henry, um, head of PKF US. Uh, we do a lot of consulting for developers um, who are in creative spaces and some more traditional spaces. And I come from a development background, um, just opened a proper hotel in LA, but based in Austin. So it's been a fun change of pace. Fantastic. So who in the audience has gone glamping before? Raise your hand. Awesome. So what you guys may not know is that glamping was first a Google term in 2007. But before that, for centuries, it has been done more organically th throughout culture. So we're gonna start with our panelists telling us how glamping came into their life, personally or professionally. I'm kicking off. Um, so we had talked about this. Um, I realized that one of the most special, um, I would call it glamping experiences, is the lightning field in New Mexico, which is a wonderful art installation by Walter de Maria from the 70s, and what happens is you go and you spend a night in a cabin, only six people, you book in advance for months, um, and you stare at lightning rods that are beautifully placed and are meant to attract lightning, but really what happens at the end of a 24-hour period is you realize you've just been having a, a communion with light and understanding light and looking at the passage of time. And it's a, a transportative experience and it's a very nice thing to realize that, you know, this had nothing to do with lightning or a cabin. This had everything to do with um, having an experience that really more deeply connected you with your surroundings. So it's been a joy with a number of clients from global clients to, you know, individuals putting tents outside of New York City in an arts camp to explore all of the ways that um, we get to commune with nature. Incredible. Shakita? Oh, yeah, awesome. Um, I didn't grow up camping uh, at all. And so I grew up in South Carolina, and we never considered nature nature. We called it the woods, right? <laughs> and the woods was a place you just didn't go to. It was just too many tides, too um, traumatic experiences in the black community, and especially in the south, in the low country, in the Gullah Geechee community where I grew up. And so my first... Um, you know, introduction into camping was via my husband, who is from Charlotte, North Carolina, and who's also a co-founder of Camp Yoshi. And um, him and his brother would take these, what they call trips to nowhere. They were looking for a way as adults with wives and children and demanding lives to reconnect. And so they would ship their cars out to the middle of nowhere in Arizona or Utah. And they would go out together for two weeks and just kind of adventure out. And meanwhile, I'm in New York at the time, afraid, right? Like, no phone reception. They would have satellite phone service every once in a while and give a ring to me and my sister-in-law. But I did not really see um, what my brother-in-law and my husband, um, how they were so comfortable, how they were, um, had seen this, this sense and feeling of just safety and release and reconnection in nature. And then fast forward, my husband and I moved to Portland, Oregon um, for a career opportunity for myself. And here I am immersed with, you know, if I'm gonna love the Pacific Northwest, I better love nature. I better get out here. I start hiking, I start taking our kids, we're taking our kids out on camping adventures. And 
I have to tell you, it was the first time that I truly understood like the healing powers. And it was also the first time that I understood that wellness is a privilege. Like it's not something that we all have access to. And it was important for me, and especially thinking about my family in the Carolinas and our friends back east, um, and specifically during the pandemic, they need to understand this sense of healing and the sense of connection um, that I've been experiencing over the last three years in Portland. Um, and they need to see nature for nature and not think of it as I had grown up thinking of it as the woods, right? And so that's my experience and in introduction. Amazing. Um, so I, um, I did some camping uh, growing up, um, not a lot. Um, I love making fires, so that was, <laughs> <laughs> camping was a good excuse. Um, and, uh, but you know, my path to glamping came through real estate development uh, and then the hotel business, um, and then uh, working on a hotel project in, you know, the, uh, around uh, 2010, where we were gonna um, have a glamping element, and I, I met the founders of our, of our company. I came to uh, Firelight Camps about three years after it was founded uh, to, to work on the growth of the, the project, but um, of, 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 the, of the brand. Amazing. One of the things I've loved getting to speak with, with the group over the last couple of days is that they all come from a very different background and a very different experience. And I know the first time I went glamping, I was hiking with some friends and they're like, this concept's incredible because you're making the outdoors accessible. And whether that's, you know, from a, a tactical perspective or, you know, a background perspective, it, it really is an incredible you know, way to bring bring hospitality to the to the great unknown and off the beaten path. So, um, would love to hear from your guys' perspectives. You know how you look at um, making that outdoor experience attainable for the guest, managing those expectations, and just an, an inclusive experience. Whether you grew up doing it like your like your husband and um, brother in law, or have never been there like a lot of urbanites. So, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about that? Shakita, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so. The way that we think about it from a Camp Yoshi lens is, you know, starting with me, because I was the, you know, hesitant camper, right? I was the person that had the most questions before we venture out to Montana to Glacier Park and, you know, wanting to understand if the uh, bears were going to um, visit That's us. That's a fair question. That's a night. fair question. So I start with myself because I'm the reluctant camper, or I was, and so thinking about you know, what experience would really make me want to go to an unfamiliar place? Because we're not going to national parks where there's tons of rangers around and other tourists nearby. We're going far out. We're truly an adventure tourism group, right? So we're taking 12 campers far away from really off the beaten path, right? And um, true form with no cell reception and the majority of our campers, 90% are first time campers, right? So how do you make them comfortable and make them feel safe? The first thing for me was, you know, number one, this sense of belonging. Like there doesn't, there, there's this sense of not feeling that you see yourself in spaces. And so you automatically think, I don't belong here. This is not what I grew up doing. This is not for me and so, Sensory is everything, imagery is everything. And so when we start intentionally inviting people out to explore, that's what they do. They, they say, oh, curiosity strikes. So that's the first thing. The second thing is even in the unfamiliar, you have to bring some familiarity. So BIPOC people, what do we love? Good food. We don't wanna go camping far off the beaten path and we just have granolas and crackers and whatever else to eat. Like we want real food. My husband who's a um, co-founder as well as Camp Yoshi is also a chef. And so these are passions of his emerging, right? I've never gone on a camping trip where I didn't have an open fire with you know, amazing steak or you know, some type of local fish um, on the grill and so that's an important part of it. Um, we always have mixologists on our trip because you should always like be able to enjoy a great cocktail after a long hike. Um, and so we create experiences where we make it comfortable as well, right? So we're gonna take you far out and you're gonna get into the unfamiliar, but we're also making it very familiar for you. There, um, I don't know how many people are, um, 
very familiar with the film Love Jones, but having Love Jones playing on a projector screen against a Jeep Wrangler or Rubicon in the middle of, you know, Moab, they're like, oh my gosh, like, this is amazing. 60% of our campers are returning campers for 2022. Um, that's because of intentionality. That's because of inviting them. They have never been invited out, you know, personally. And so intentionality is everything for us, and that drives the inclusivity um, and the entire guest experience from the, the moment that they go on our social media page and they see our media, our content, they see themselves and they wanna experience it. That's an incredible retention rate if your first customer started their first time camping and now you have, you know, an overwhelming majority of your, your guests are repeat customers. I mean, Janine, the data on that must be pretty incredible about, you know, the guest experience and, and you know, the statistics of people coming, coming camping. And 70% of our campers, which we could not have foreseen this, are females. Women of color deciding that they want to go into the unknown. Right? They're not the people, they're not usually the demographic. You know, when you think about Camp Yoshi, we're kind of wedged between three spaces. We're outdoor, we're also, you know, hospitality, and then we're also adventure tourism. And neither of those three spaces really focus on women of color. And so for 70% of our bookers, not husbands booking for them, but bookers themselves and campers on these trips are women of color, that's astounding. And so, you know, I think that that's a, another metric <laughs> that would be, you know, something that's not necessarily what you constantly see and hear, you know, spoken about, but I think that, and I know we'll get to this later, I think that that's the future of when you think about adventure tourism and things like camp clamping and can, I know you have like similar statistics and camping in general. Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. Um, I do have some numbers, which I think are interesting. Um, I feel like with, with COVID, um, there was a lot of discovery. There were some first time families going out and saying, well, this is what we've got, so let's go do it. And, and they loved it. And now you've got major institutional dollars that are starting to come into some of the proven larger brands. I think the top four with the most units out there um, which almost feel like they're the Marriott's of the world at this point, you know, because they're not the one-offs. They're, yeah. they're the ones that have $100 million of institutional funding and they're growing very quickly. They, um, they've been doing a lot of their market data and saying, now this is what people want. They need families. We want to be the four seasons of this. We need, and I know, Matt, you guys have explored this and discovered everybody needs an end suite private bathroom, which was not always the case. You know, there's great evolution. But yeah, KOA, um, Campgrounds of America, noted 260% increase in glamping and to, from 2019 to 2020. All of this is continuing. The wellness tourism industry, which wellness is a $4.2 trillion industry. Wellness tourism went from $640 billion in 2017 and is projected to do 1.1 trillion. 10 years later, which is astonishing. Um, sustainability, um, you know, transformational travel, all of these things continue to be incredibly important. And I love that TripAdvisor just did a survey where 59% said that they prefer off the beaten path. Um, we didn't organize this, but <laughs> yeah. experiences that have canoeing, hiking, horseback riding, that kind of a thing. So it, adventure is by all means, um, something incredibly intact and it's here to stay, proven by COVID. Um, and I think what's interesting, and we've, we've written about this recently, we're now getting to a place where you really have to know who you are, what you're offering. You can't just kind of you know charge $700 a night because it's a glamping experience, but you totally. have to have personality and intention, so. And I think, you know, hitting all of the major words, sustainable, obviously growth, health, wellness, inclusivity, with that, you are out in the, you know, off the beaten path, and in, in, you could be operating a brand in the high desert, in the, in the woods, dealing with snakes, having to, you know, address bears and, and your friendly neighbors, um, plus or minus. Um, so, Matt, 
from the operating perspective, what are the things that people, you know, really need to think about in this space that, you know, as you got into it, starting as a, an urban operator and now moving, moving into the out, outdoors, what would be like the most expected and then unexpected operational consideration you, you feel like you've had there? Yeah, so um, I think that uh, bears are not going to be a problem. <laughs> Um, the, You're in New York, though. Yeah. No, right. Yes, that's true. Brown bears are not a problem. Montana um, may be different. Yes, I agree. We'll, we'll get there. Um, the, um, the the private bathroom uh, issue that Channing uh, references is, is very real. I think there's a lot of people out there who uh, will never try it if they're forced to walk to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Um, I think those who do realize it's not as bad as they were feared, especially if it's a nice bathroom. Um, and there are sites uh, where, for environmental reasons, um, maybe it's not feasible to do uh, private bathrooms at every, at every location, but they could be a spectacular location you know, that uh, I think people would, would go to. Um, in our property in Ithaca, we do have a shared bathhouse. Um, and I'll say that we have almost a $300 average rate. Uh, you know, over the course of our season, and that this past season we were 85% occupied. So um, I think, again, looking to the future of glamping, um, there's, you know, to cut to the chase, I think there's going to be a lot more of it to come, and I think private bathrooms will be, you know, the, the main kind of differentiator um, between properties. But uh, Yeah, and we'll touch more on the future in a little bit. So, Channing, you advise a lot of different developers, owners, operators. What do you think about when they consider and approach the glamping opportunity? I mean, there's there's cost, profitability, and margins, but again, you know, the elements, you know, that Matt just described. What is some of the advice you give to them, you know, when you approach that conversation? Something that we've discovered, or you know, it's a it's a it's a fact about this is that oftentimes the more units you have. Um, you know, the more expensive your infrastructure gets as opposed to the opposite when you're building a big box. And that's not something that everybody, um, you know, kind of goes into thinking scalability is the answer to everything. So, um, you know, there's a lot of consideration around are we four seasons, two seasons? Are we investing in heavy, you know, canvas? Are we offering all-inclusive activities? There's, there's a lot of... Um, holistic understanding of the entire offering that you're that one needs to understand before going into this food and beverage being one of those you just you either have a great F&B experience or you prepare people for here's how you make it great for what you need to do and you know but nothing is um, necessarily easy from the operations perspective relative to some of the more urban properties um, but what happens is when you figure it out and they think do it in the right way is the um, the returns are very handsome. You can operate, you know, at, with a little bit less staff. Your capital costs up front are much less than traditional, and um, and you can operate, you know, oftentimes 30, 40, 50 percent margin, which is um, quite excellent in this industry. Just about any industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll agree with Channing there. I, we, we've, um, I think, a lot of the, the question of. of how operationally profitable you're going to be has to do with the size of the property. And uh, many glamping facilities today are small. Um, they're 10 tents, four tents in a backyard. Um, our property in Ithaca is 19 tents, and we've achieved something like a 30% operating margin. Um, we uh, have a, so I'll just say quickly. So we, we have a property in Ithaca um, that was, uh, has been operating for eight years. Um, that property has 19 tents. Uh, a lobby tent uh, with a bar, um, central campfires. We don't do campfires at every uh, unit. Uh, we do uh, like half a dozen campfires in Ithaca that are clustered around the bar, and it makes for a very active uh, social uh, experience at night. Um, and then um, some event facilities and, and a shared bathhouse. Um, we have a property in the Catskills that is under development that'll be uh, opening in uh, June of 2023, um, a year from this summer. Um, that'll be 80 tents, all private bathrooms, um, and uh, a lobby with uh, a bar and a counter service restaurant, um, all organic, local, um, and uh, yeah, that's, and we've got a couple more in the pipeline beyond that. So Camp Yoshi is uh, massively different, right? Yep. We have a very low asset model, I like to call it, because we uh, do not have a structure. We don't have infrastructure. We don't have base camps. 
or glamping um, uh, expenses in the same capacity, we, uh, in, in that model, it allows us to remain flexible. It does present its challenges because we have business partners across the US that are landowners and we want raw, untouched, undeveloped property. That's where we lean in and we make a lot of partnerships and build relationships across communities who do not want development coming in their communities. They want to keep it raw. They want it as a place where people can come and truly, truly connect um, and see you know, all of its grandeur and beauty. And so we have a lot of uh, partnerships and, and deals uh, with landowners. And at any given time, the challenge that does exist is that they could say, well, you know, maybe now I want to develop something and they might change their minds. But within our model, because we are adventure tourism, it allows us to remain flexible. And so we can pick up and say, well, that's fine. We'll go 10 miles down the street to the other landowner, right? Um, part of our scaling opportunity, um, as we look at it, we've thought about base camp locations. Um, but I think that more so than anything, we want raw land. We want undeveloped land, and that's going to be part of our model go forward. That's incredible. And when you think, because you, you operate in a variety of different states and an ever-moving land target, um, and, you know, Matt, you guys are growing from, you know, a smaller camp to a, an 80-tent 80, 80 camp. It's, it's almost on the mega camp scale. I don't know, Channing, if that's a technical definition, but um, how do you maintain the guest experience? And I know, Shakita, this is your passion passion point, you know, the, the guest experience in controlled hotels is hard enough to maintain temperature, smell, water pressure, bedding, um, and then you move out where you have no control of the, yeah. the elements. It, it changes everything. So yeah. I'd love to hear from, from your, both your perspectives on that. Well, we teach people the truth. I, th I think one of the things about moving from the East Coast to the Pacific Northwest, and at this point in my life, I've lived in the Carolinas, I lived on the Northeast, I lived in the Pacific Northwest, I lived in the Midwest. So I've lived throughout the US pretty much, right? The one thing about the Pacific Northwest, no matter what the weather is, you better get out and find a way to enjoy it, right? Or you're gonna be miserable. And so one of the things that we really bring into our programming, I don't care if it's raining while we're on a 10,000 feet, you know, overlooking the side of a mountain in Uray, Colorado. It's raining, we're gonna have a good time. Programming continues. The guests, the campers, they, get excited about that. It's like having adult sleepaway camp for them. <laughs> like they're, they're excited to disconnect. They're excited to be out there. And so our programming is centered around the fact that, you know, number one, we do an intake, a personal one-on-one -on -one intake before the start of our trips, 45 days out. We call each camper. We only do 12 campers on each trip. We do an intake and we talk about everything from beginning to end. Number one question is, do you have restrooms? No. You're in the wilderness, you're in nature, but you're gonna pitch this campsite and you're gonna have this fabulous what you never thought you could have in terms of a private uh, place to do your business. And they get out there and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, I didn't expect this. And I'm like, what did you expect? That you were gonna dig a hole and like cover it? Um, we have a little bit more kook than that. But um, you know, I think it's more so of giving them, you're, you're setting the expectation up front. They also, most of this is word of mouth, like we haven't spent a dime in marketing. Um, most of our campers are coming to us because their friends and relatives or family have also been on a trip. And so they give them the download. Social media is a very, very strong platform. And so we do a lot of reels where we show you like, what is it like, you know? What is it like? Um, where are you going to be using the restroom? What is your camp setup going to look like? What are you eating for breakfast versus lunch? Uh, what are the excursions throughout? And so you can go to our social media platform and see all of that. And I think the sensory is important. Like they connect with their eyes. No one reads anything anymore. We have all this information on our website. You call 45 minutes before you know the trip launch date, and most of the campers are like, really? I didn't know there wasn't a bathroom, <laughs> right? Like no one reads, but they see everything via video and sensory. And so um, that's, that's what's most important to us in terms of the experience is that we can't foresee Mother Earth, but our programming continues and to dance in the rain, so to speak. Unplanned question, if rain's in the forecast, do you bring two mixologists? <laughs> One is usually enough. <laughs> One's usually enough. We, um, we actually have a funny, we had a trip in, um, in Uray, Colorado uh, in August, and 
I mean, the winds got a lot more aggressive than what anything that we could have imagined, right? So mixologist is under his uh, cocktail area and he's whipping <laughs> up cocktails and then all of a sudden, the wind just picks up Oof. the entire tent, right? And we're like, all of the campers go to save the alcohol. Naturally. <laughs> You're recruiting smart people. They went straight for the bourbon and the yes. mezcal. Like, no one <laughs> went to help with the, with the tent. But at the end of the day, like, gear is important, right? And in that moment, we were like, oh, we need to reassess this particular climate because it was, you know, part of the, the learning um, for us. Um, we thought we had all the right gear. We have a lot of brand partners. We um, really obsess the gear that we use um, not from a quality standpoint, but then also we have gear for different topographies and ecosystems that we're in. And so we had to reassess that, that particular ecosystem um, and the gear that we were using and to just, you know, just to make sure that we're prepared. I have to add something to that one. There's this wonderful hotel called the Amani Khas in Rajasthan, India which is beautiful tents, you know, double height ceiling, bathtubs where they dry you a bath after safari, but all very simple. And when I went to the room with, you know, the man who was showing it to us, there was a little field mouse and, um, and I jumped and he said, no, no, it's nature. And I was like, okay, that's great. You know, and all of a sudden your whole mindset changes and you realize, no, no, this is what we're here to do. Yeah. And, if he's not scared, I'm not scared. Yeah. We're great. So. You're like, I just don't want him in my tent, though. Right. <laughs> don't. We're in nature, but stay in your place. No, but it is about setting the tone and you know making you Absolutely. feel like, okay, someone's got me. I may not got me, but yeah. someone does. Well, here's another funny story. Same place. We're in Colorado, and we have a camper. Three o'clock in the morning. Are we reassessing this location? It sounds no, like a challenge. No, it's an amazing one. location. <laughs> okay. Come to Colorado with us. Um, what, but we have a camper who knocks on my tent three o'clock in the morning, and she's whispering, and she goes, Shakita, I have to use the restroom, but I'm afraid to walk to the restroom alone. Can you wake up and walk with me to the restroom? And so I'm you know, slowly waking up and realizing, like, oh, like she's really afraid. And I was like, but you're halfway there. You already walked. <laughs> like, <laughs> you've already walked halfway there. It's right there. And so she had me get up and go stand yeah. and wait until she finished using the restroom. But it was more of just like safety, right, for her, like mentally. She wanted to make sure, like no matter what, that someone was there. Was that early in the trip? That was early on the trip. Yeah. By the second day, she was using the restroom on her own. See, that's your mission. But then that's also that's... maintain, you know, managing the number of cocktails uh, that you're giving out throughout the night. Yeah. But no, the, but these are things that's part of the experience. That's part of like, to me, hospitality part yeah. the she knew that she could knock on any of the staff and crews tents and say like I need help right and that we were gonna make sure that she was okay um, and so after that night she was completely fine and and totally immersed um, but you have examples like that these are first-time campers yeah absolutely Fantastic. <laughs> Matt, from a brand perspective, as you guys get ready to expand, what are like critical elements that you're going to hold on to? Um, you know, because that, that's almost a completely from the, the bathhouse, it sounds like you've brought it up a few times, yeah. is, is part of the original experience. Now we're moving in suite. You know, how do we, what are, yeah, what no, are that's, that's, we that's I think that's an important uh, element for opening up to people. Um, I think looking uh, to the future for Firelight, um, Firelight uh, in Ithaca, uh, we're on the border of a, a state park. People walk into the state park. They go on waterfall hikes, and they come back, and they hang out around the campfire. Um, I think that th that um, kind of resort-type amenity uh, is, is critical, meaning that uh, you should be able to wake up in the camp, um, spend the day in the camp, um, and, and go to bed in the camp and, and not run out of um, things to do or, or not to. I mean, including, I guess, one of the things is lay in a hammock by the side of a river and, you know, uh, relax. Um, but, you know, our property uh, in, uh, in, in the Catskills is on the side of a river. We're going to do fly fishing and tubing um, directly from the property. There'll be daily yoga um, uh, classes and programming um, uh, of all sorts, um, drum making workshops and the like. Um, things that are uh, kind of teeter into the uh, spirituality side of wellness um, in addition to the, the physical uh, side of wellness and the, um, 
the, the uh, you know, the big question stuff that just to give people space. It's, it's available, but not uh, mandatory in, in any way, shape, or form. So a full evolution kind of of the brand, like the next level or... Right. So um, the, uh, you know, I think an, another element that's, that's critical to the experience um, is coming around uh, the fire at night. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's really, something happens when uh, people go out into nature during the day, um, they have these adventures, um, and then they they come and sit around a campfire and stare into the flames and um, and, and meet new people or or spend time with uh, their loved ones and it's it's uh, it's an amazing experience to see people get kind of drawn closer together. It truly is one of the more kind of magical, powerful, uh, not quite like the lightning fields, but I, I do think, and especially with strangers, it, it does. It's more than just a regular bar. It is a gathering that you just kind of can look up and you look at the stars and you say, wow, you know, here I am, just truly off the beaten path, which is, is pretty special. Yeah, yeah it, it, it makes it easy to meet new people, which is kind of an unusual thing. Totally. Um, so we've, we've alluded to it a little bit, um, and I know that, you know, part of the whole I idea and concept behind ILC is talking about, you know, creativity, bringing people together, um, and, and idea generation. There's nothing to me that does that more than the outdoors, than the sake of adventure, than, than moving beyond where you normally go, the campfire. Um, so would love to hear from you guys and Channing let's start with you on what the, the future holds for glamping we've got some owner operators out here we've got some designers we've got brand people what what's the future hold um, for this relatively untapped um, another fun fact glamping um, was added to the to the dictionary in 2016 so it's a it's a growing budding field so so let's talk about the, what the future holds um, it holds so much. It's very exciting. I feel like um, this crew in particular, who's so creative and connected to programming and experience and beauty and connectivity, um, this is the perfect canvas for it. And I think one of the things that first hit me was it really isn't about the physical structure. It's about you know how you're inviting people into um, an RV trip a you know a camp of an adventure um a getaway that's either tiny or it's five thousand dollars a night in utah you know i mean there's just so many versions of this um but it really does take um a lot of this um, intentional programming and design and simplicity and i do think you know nature is art and the extent to which we can allow that to to seriously unfold um, the more um, investment will be easier to attract because I think we're at this very interesting inflection point of unprecedented demand um, and fabulous returns on a lot of these properties um, where you've got some of the bigger players starting to come in, but um, it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of definition that's happening right now. So as per a lot of the other conversations we've heard on brand and identity and cultural programming, you know, really knowing who you are going in and how to celebrate the land that you're going into. Um, there's gonna be a lot of ways to unfold that. Celebrate the land, I love that. It does, that's phenomenal. Yeah, I see uh, this industry continuing to grow um, because people just want, you, you, they want you to kind of take the room and, and just show them the way, right? And so a lot of the thinking behind planning a trip, planning a vacation, plan, like what you're gonna get out of it. How are you gonna feel afterwards? How many times have you been on a trip and come back and you just feel ever more exhausted than when you left, right? And didn't feel like you really got that chance to disconnect, to reconnect in a sense. Um, and, and almost feeling like to some degree you were trying to escape life versus going on an adventure that allowed you to just pause and enjoy it. And experience it and so I think that it's here to stay because we're taking the the legwork the the guessing game out of it you just show up from a Camp Yoshi experience we're doing everything for you we're creating um, the space and we're creating the moments in which you can truly un uncharge and and disconnect and and really just find your healing space um, and when I think about the campers that camp with us, we do a lot of surveying before and after trips, um, and especially the 60% that rebooked, the, the number one thing was um, you made it easy. 
We all need more of that. We, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sign up for anything where Inclusive you do experiences everything. Experiences. Yeah. Throughout. Amazing. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. I mean, customers, guests just love the experience, um, and uh, you know that's the primary reason we're going to see so much more of this. Um, I think that the um, the the development now of some larger properties is going to bring uh, maybe the, the the ADRs down a little bit um, a, as we go forwards. But there's just going to be a lot more of it uh, available. Um, you know, the product that we're uh, developing in the Catskills now. Uh, compares experience-wise to something that, you know, in today's market gets a much higher ADR uh, than, than, than what we're planning for, for uh, the Catskills because those, those other properties are generally smaller. You know, where at, at 80 tenths we can achieve some economies of scale uh, that will allow us to increase margins and, and lower ADRs. And if it's not us, it's going to be somebody else. So um, I see, you know, more competition in the space, a lot more availability of glamping experiences, um, and a, uh, you know, more amenities around it um, and uh, just you know, broader adoption. Incredible. Um, so I wanna make sure, because we do not wanna go over to keep people from happy hour. Um, is there any questions out in the audience? Okay, I'm gonna run over, get my steps in. Um, you made an excellent point. You said that you know wellness seems to be a privilege, and I think that's really true. Um, I have a client in Carmel Valley that is has restored a girls' camp, and she refuses to call it glamping because she thinks it sounds very exclusive. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we sort of, as an industry, democratize connections to nature so that we don't essentially gentrify the woods? Oh, that's such a good... Wow, you said a mouthful. Um, we, my husband and I, we talk about that all the time, right? Because even for Camp Yoshi, our product is not inexpensive. Um, but the way that we um, are continuing to make this an inclusive and democratize, like keep it a, a place that anyone feels that it's accessible um, and, and reachable is working with organizations. Like we're working with nonprofits. There's tons of brands that are positioning, you know, budgets for DEI purposes that we are working and leaning into to make sure that youth groups, um, domestic violent group, uh, violent sufferers um, and uh, survivors, that they can experience this too. This should not be just for, you know, a, a specific demographic and socioeconomic status in terms of who is allowed to be a part of nature. Um, camping is expensive. I think I was just having this conversation. Investment in true quality camp gear, that's gonna cost a lot of money for you to, like, to decide like if I like this or not, right? And so that's how we see you know, Camp Yoshi also from an education factor. Like we're educating you on how to get outdoors. We're educating on you on how to sustainably get outside so that you can lead these places, paces, sorry, places in the same context that you found them. Um, we practice leave no trace. We practice leave a small footprint. And so if we educate from parents, down to youth groups on how to effectively do this, then our uh, position is that not only will they see themselves here, but when they come back, they know how to treat it so that it's around for another 20, 30 years for the next generation um, to be able to lean into as well. I'd love to add to that really quickly is um, a lot of, we, we keep trying to get ESG funds interested in the space because there's a lot of overlapping aligned interests. Um, and I found it interesting that one fund that really believed in this one major land conservation glamping operation in Costa Rica ultimately passed because they just said, you know, this is, this, this is not only for the upper classes. Like, this really isn't the way that we're supposed to be appreciating nature and handling this. And um, even though I know with our clients that we can recommend that they push on ADR, um, I always really like to espouse a, you know, this really is for everybody at all kinds of price points, and this is the point, right? You know, so there's a lot of thinking out there. Yeah, I agree. That's going to happen more and more, and and I totally agree that gl that glamorous is exactly the wrong word, you know, and for it's the cringeworthy, uh, to be honest, you know, and uh, I've stopped hearing it. Uh, I've said it so much, but it, it's totally the wrong word. Question over here. 
Hi, everybody. Um, this is really interesting. I'm definitely that woman of color who has no interest in the woods, nature. You can't <laughs> pay me to get there. Um, so I appreciate uh, hearing the point of view and the pathway. But I wonder if, for people like me, where you guys are seeing the opportunity from a B2B perspective, because if my company paid for it, I might <laughs> find an interest in that. But also just thinking of the like team building elements of that. And B2C is one thing, I think, when folks are doing this during COVID, they want to get closer to nature. But I wonder if you guys are seeing the same opportunity when you're looking at corporate groups and, and events. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Like um, Camp Yoshi already has, uh, we, we don't even lean into port, uh, brand partnerships unless there's a longevity in terms of multi-year approach and DEI specific because whatever we do it needs to be feeding internally to the employees we need to understand what the DEI strategy is um, and then also externally um, right so you want us to think about your products and positioning products and seeding products for Camp Yoshi, um, then we're gonna talk about DEI and internally what that looks like, um, not only for your employees, but also how your consumers interact with your brand and what they see. Um, so we have a lot of partnership um, conversations. Uh, one one um, collaboration we just closed a deal on where we are actually working directly with their DEI team um, to foster building community amongst their employees um, internally and have a multi-year program built around that um, where they'll be paying to get their employees outside um, to focus on healing, to focus on connection um, and belonging. So that's definitely primary focus. And then on the flip side of that, for someone like yourself, who's not re ready to yet yeah, jump deep in, we're also um, exploring another product called, that we're calling Camp Yoshi Field Trips. And they'll be very um, localized, where it's not necessarily an overnight camping adventure, but the adventure itself, in terms of the excursion, the experience around food and beverage, is also a part of it. Um, we think that that's a way to start the relationship with the outdoors and education on the outdoors, which is you know our number one priority as well. It's a great way to fill um, midweek nights too, because it's such a weekend. Thing in a lot of cases yeah and you know I think again private bathrooms is something that facilitates <laughs> that I mean not, not to keep coming back on this but I think an obstacle to um, bringing uh, for some companies to hold off-sites um, would be not offering their employees bathrooms and I think that's a that's a big part <laughs> sorry um, and the last thing I'll say on that point is that um, you know the the, the changes that COVID has accelerated has really helped the glamping industry. You know, uh, we, we were 96% uh, occupied in 2020. We were 85% occupied um, this year. And we were growing quickly before, but um, it's just so many more people um, have tried it now and there's just so much more interest in it. And I think that the, uh, the other COVID changes of allowing remote work and uh, the need for uh, more corporate offsites is also going to kind of play into the glamping, you know, space. Awesome. One last question. Um, hi, hi everyone. I, I love the panel as well. Um, I just wanted to actually ask. Uh, so I come from Central Europe, and there's a long history of essentially kind of, um, I guess, basically kind of uh, uh, health breaks and things like that, where essentially people were kind of uh, shoved to take their waters and things like that in the uh, in in nature and i wonder if actually the um uh, the aspect of mental health and kind of well-being and, and especially kind of partnerships with with health uh, insurance companies and things like that if you see that that's that's a big kind of uh, trend going forward I, I saw a couple of days ago that Canada has basically started actually kind of allowing uh, doctors to kind of almost prescribe these types of trips. Is this a trend or is this something that, that, that you don't think is being explored enough? Definitely wellness is a major part of this. Um, I'm not sure that it has gotten into the insurance part of things or you know the doctors prescribed, but the taking the waters, absolutely. Um, I always appreciated the getaway when you go into their cabins. They, they really have boxes where you put your phone away and they've almost got too much literature in some cases, but it's great, you know, here's what you're here to do and take it easy and take a break. And so, um, yes, it's part of it. And I think it's an excellent idea to try to 
turn that into something even more formalized. Um, but yeah, it's there's uh, there's so much um, I don't know spa, all kinds of you know activities, forest bathing, everything that's really kind of how do you actually further encourage the the unwinding, the great unwinding. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And then a question for the audience. Those who did not raise their hand that they'd been glamping when we started this conversation 42 minutes ago, are you, are you going glamping now? Yes? We got, a, we got a definitive yes from a lady in the second row. So that's awesome. So we're already acquiring new customers for your business concept. We're going to keep that triple growth, triple digit growth growing. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Happy hour. Here we come. Thanks. Thank you guys. Let me go on.